So I was on a long, unannounced hiatus that was partially inspired by the whole death plague that raged across the world, especially my home country. It certainly didn't help that doing research more in-depth than Google Books was practically impossible for a couple of months there. Anyway, let's put our troubles aside and instead talk about a gay lover spat that changed the course of world history. Probably. Unless it was actually a political conspiracy by Alexander the Great and his mother Olympias to kill her husband and Alexander's father, King Philip II of Macedon. Although it was almost certainly a little from column A and a little from column B. Now, Philip is generally only known today as Alexander the Great's father. Honestly, though, there's a great case to be made that Philip deserves to be known as the Great more than Alexander does. Sure, Alexander toppled the Persian Empire, the superpower of his day. Plus, even though Alexander's own empire fractured almost immediately after his premature death, he did change the world in ways that are incalculable. But he wouldn't have been able to do any of it if his father hadn't turned an impoverished, unstable kingdom at the risk of being devoured by its neighbors into a first-rate nation that brought the city-states of Greece, except admittedly Sparta, to their knees. Alexander the Great's biographer Arian claims Alexander said this about his father, or more likely Arian just came up with the speech and placed it in his mouth. Regardless, there is a ring of truth to it. Philip took you over when you were helpless vagabonds, mostly clothed in skins. He gave you cloaks to wear instead of skins. He brought you down from the mountains to the plains. He made you a match in battle for the barbarians on your borders. He made you city dwellers and established the order that comes from good laws and customs. Philip himself did receive the best education a ruler can get, by which I mean he spent most of his youth with his life in danger. As a child, Philip was handed over as a hostage as part of political negotiations, first with the king of a neighboring kingdom in the Balkans, and then to the northern Greek city-state of Thebes. While away, both his brothers got to be king, and they both came to bad ends. One, Alexander II, was assassinated, and the other, Perdiccas III, died fighting Macedon's neighbors. While Macedon was on the brink, though, Philip was growing up in Thebes, which at the time had defeated its main rivals, Athens and Sparta, and became the dominant power in Greece. Philip's education wasn't wasted, unlike my own. He learned firsthand the things that made the Greeks a formidable opponent, their military tactics, and the effective organization of their governments. But he also witnessed the bitter feuds between the various Greek city-states. This would be something he would be able to exploit to his own benefit once he became king. In fact, during his own time in Thebes, Philip may have been the lover of the Theban general Pamines in what would have been a traditional Greek pederastic relationship in which an adolescent or teenage male has a sexually charged mentorship under an older man. Granted, the earliest existing account of Philip and Pamines becoming lovers came centuries later. That said, though, it is even more certain that Philip was a lifetime admirer of the sacred band of Thebes, a special corps of soldiers said to have been composed entirely of male couples. Of course, admiring them didn't stop Philip from killing them when he would conquer Thebes many years later, but we'll probably talk about the sacred band in another episode at some point. Whatever his personal life was really like, it didn't distract Philip once he returned to Macedon. He quietly deposed the current king, his infant nephew, Imentus IV. Although he left his nephew alive, he took the crown of Macedon for himself and set about tidying up the place. He radically changed military organization, training and tactics, and modernized, uh, well, relatively speaking, the government. With a new, better organized army, with a more functional government behind it, 
Philip set about expanding Macedon's borders into northern Greece, and after defeating a coalition of Greek city-states led by Thebes, forced most of the Greek city-states into a new coalition, the League of Corinth, which was controlled by him, of course. Philip was prolific elsewhere, too. Since the Macedonians, unlike most other Greek-speaking peoples of the time, practiced polygamy, Philip had at least seven wives and concubines, all women from the royal families of neighboring kingdoms and tribes. The most celebrated and notorious of these was Olympias, who honestly really deserves her own movie more than her famous son, Alexander the Great, let's face it. Philip was getting ready to go to war against the big bad of the classical Greek world, the Persian Empire, when suddenly he was assassinated. I don't think that there can be much doubt that this was one of the most decisive assassinations in history, since Philip probably didn't plan on the complete conquest of the Persian Empire, and he certainly would have been less reckless about running whatever conquests he made than his son would prove to be. On July 336, at festivities celebrating the marriage of his daughter Cleopatra, not that Cleopatra, the 46-year-old king of Macedon stopped to receive the applause of the crowd. While he was distracted by his people's adoration, he was stabbed by a member of his own bodyguard, Pausanias. As Philip lay dying, Pausanias tripped on a vine and stumbled to the ground. Before he could get up, the other bodyguards caught up to him and stabbed him to death with their spears. Because he was guilty of regicide, he wasn't left alone even after that. His corpse was publicly crucified and left to rot for days. Pausanias happened to not just be Philip's bodyguard, but was also, at one time, his lover. As you might expect from a 2,300-year-old case, we're not even sure what happened, even though the assassination was fairly well documented by the standards of the classical Greek world. The official explanation that the government of the new King Alexander III put out was that Pausanias acted for personal reasons, an explanation backed up by the writings of Alexander's tutor, the philosopher Aristotle, who was not only alive at the time but happened to be living in the Macedonian capital of Pella when the assassination took place. According to this account, Philip dumped Pausanias for a new lover who, very confusingly and frustratingly, also had the name Pausanias. The old Pausanias did not take this very well and complained about Philip's new infatuation to anyone who would listen. Then, in a battle fought by the king himself, the new Pausanias was killed. None of the sources make this explicit, but apparently there was foul play, whether actual or suspected, by the old Pausanias. A friend of the new and now dead Pausanias, Attalus, hatched a plan to avenge him on the old Pausanias. Somehow, Attalus lured the old Pausanias to his house, where Pausanias was gang raped. Then he was forced outside the house where a group of Attalus' slaves did the same. Naturally, Pausanias went straight to the king and begged for justice. The older accounts agree that Philip seemed genuinely horrified and sympathetic, but the later Roman historian Justin, who might have been drawing from another tradition, claims that instead Philip mocked the surely traumatized Pausanias. Whatever his personal attitude, Philip still refused to do anything since Attalus was a valued and popular general who was desperately needed for the upcoming campaign against Persia. However, there were other suspects involved too, the victim's own wife and son. See, Philip had also recently married his seventh wife, Cleopatra. Not to be confused with that Cleopatra, or the Cleopatra I just mentioned. She was a Macedonian noblewoman Philip had married, apparently not for political reasons like all his other wives, but out of genuine love, or lust. He was infatuated enough with Cleopatra that Olympias and Alexander were apparently concerned that Philip would disinherit Alexander and instead make any son conceived by Cleopatra his new heir, a fear sharpened by the fact that Alexander had had a falling out with his father. So was Pausanias actually put up to it by Olympias and Alexander, who tricked him by making him believe that 
more people were in on the plot, and thus he would have been able to actually escape. If so, was he just acting because he thought Olympias and the new king would reward him well? Or was he genuinely also seeking revenge against a man he had once loved but who had so viciously betrayed him? It doesn't help that there's another story that Pausanias just wanted to become famous. So basically, according to this tale, he pulled a Mark David Chapman millennia before the genuine article. Philip II's modern biographer, Ian Worthington, who I actually took a class under once, by the way, and I'm sure he'd be delighted to know he inspired me to make a YouTube video, has done a fantastic job of summarizing the odd details and ambiguities baked into the ancient accounts. Was it just a coincidence that Attalus happened to be the uncle of Philip's new wife, Cleopatra? What about the fact that Attalus became one of the first people Alexander had killed as soon as he ascended to the throne? Was Aristotle, by repeating the official story, trying to protect Alexander by making it seem like Philip was just the victim of a private vendetta? Why did Pausanias strike months after his rape, at a time when Atticus was out of town? What is the significance of the fact that Pausanias was trying to reach horses, and not just one horse, when he made his deadly fall? And why kill the king right in the middle of such a public venue, when being the king's bodyguard probably gave him far better and safer opportunities to attack? Well, wondering if Olympias and Alexander got their hands dirty in the whole business is kind of outside my job description. I will say, though, that I do believe the official story about Pausanias' motives, whether or not he was also given at least a push by Alexander and his mother. The fact that there are missing and ambiguous details in the story, like what exactly happened to make Attalus decide to take such brutal, inhuman revenge on Pausanias, makes the narrative more likely to be at least partially true, not less. And honestly, the account of Pausanias' multiple gang rapes does give it a chilling authenticity, and it would certainly explain why Pausanias would want to kill Philip in such a public and dramatic fashion, even at the risk of his own life. Who could resist the opportunity to take the life of your betrayer at the peak of his glory, when and where he would feel safest. At the very least, suffering such a trauma could make anyone act in such an irrational rage that would baffle the ancient historians. Honestly, as I write these very words, the story touches me more than I thought it would when I first came up with the idea for this video. Now, put aside the historical significance of Philip II, and the rising son of Alexander the Great, and the cutthroat drama of the Macedonian royal court. Instead, try to focus on the story of Pausanias, a young warrior, serving as the loyal guard and lover of his king, the greatest monarch his society ever knew. Then, suddenly, he's abandoned. Either rightly or wrongly, He's suspected of getting his rival for the king's heart killed in the heat of battle. A powerful man decides to do something worse than an eye for an eye in the name of his fallen friend. And instead arranges to have him hurt and degraded in the worst way imaginable. He turns to the man who probably told him he loved him, who held him as they fell asleep together, only for the man to give him insults, or, perhaps worse, hollow words of pity. As the warrior nurses his justified rage, praying in vain to the gods for justice, the royal prince and his mother suddenly, for the first time, take interest in the warrior. They give him the sincere sympathy even his former beau denied him, and they stoke his anger by telling him over wine of how the family of the king's new bride, whose numbers include the very man who raped and tortured the warrior, are plotting to steal the throne from Philip's rightful heir and give it to some child of their own bloodline whose strings they would pull. Philip was too far gone into their clutches. And anyway, 
For years he had proven himself to be an evil and ungrateful man, willing to betray his own wife, son, and lover. But at least a warrior was in a position to make things right, using his place as the king's bodyguard to make sure his tormentors, the enemies of the royal prince, would not win. There are others who felt the same way, people in the royal court, and even other members of the royal bodyguard, who were disgusted by how Philip and Atticus treated the warrior, who feared for the future of the monarchy itself. Or at least that's what the prince and his mother told the warrior. Together, they all picked the perfect day, when Philip would be both at his most vulnerable, and when his moment of greatest triumph would justly be turned into the time of his downfall. Only when the warrior laid on the ground, being stabbed to death by his own friends and comrades, did he realize that the prince and the queen had lied to him. Well, I would say Olympias is not the only character from the life of Alexander the Great who deserves the spotlight, honestly. <laughs>